Dear brothers and sisters, the following khutbah was not prepared using chat GBT or any artificial intelligence. I'm gonna start off with that for a reason, because as ridiculous as that sounded for me to say it, there may come a time where that is actually the case, that people prepare their entire khutbahs, that people prepare their entire lectures. Allah knows best, people will try to replace imams and khatibs with some sort of artificial intelligence and the tools and the technology that has become made available to us today. Even if you have not yet engaged a single one of the new tools and technologies that have become made available to us, and count me amongst them who have yet to even touch ChatGBT or many of these other things that have become available to us that we pray Allah Azza wa Jal allows us to use for benefits and allows us to curtail the harm of. Allahumma ameen. I actually wanted to speak about the advent of these technologies and how as Muslims we can approach this from a spiritual framework, really not knowing much about what is to come in the years that are ahead and what these technologies are actually going to look like for us. How do we as Muslims deal with this unraveling new new reality for us, not from a place of paranoia, but from a place of preparedness and fit it into our entire framework and our entire existence of ubudiyah, of being in a state of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in a state of constant benefits. And I want to begin that as Muslims, we have always been able to see the benefit in things that are around us, especially when they become more and more inevitable. And our scholars of the past have been at the pioneering front of making technologies that would have otherwise been entirely harmful or even producing technologies that would be to the benefit of people, whether it's in science or medicine or math or what it may be. But we've also been able to spiritually frame everything, no matter how material it seems. We're a people, alhamdulillah, that have guidance from our Prophet wasallam on everything from how we eat our food to how we use the restroom. And so certainly, we have an ethical framework by which we approach the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting around us today. And as we look at these technologies that at the very least become relevant to you because maybe your kids or maybe someone that you know is using them and as a whole, the output of humanity is more and more dependent upon these technologies. I want us to first and foremost appreciate that there is a difference between tools that are for the benefit of people and tools that are for the destruction of people. And we have to understand that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us almost always has the potential to be a gift. So when we talk about tools that arise amongst us, Allah azza wa jal has given us the ability to see the difference between tools that become more precise with medical technology to the benefit of people. The difference between a more precise medical technology and a more precise military technology that makes killing people so much easier and so much more automatic. And usually, unfortunately, at the other side of that are poor Muslim populations disproportionately. And it's a tragedy if it's any innocent life or any innocent casualty. We see the difference between those two things, a medical technology that's saving more lives and a military technology that's killing more people. And Muslim pioneers have always been at the forefront of taking the beneficial of something and removing the harmful. And they also did not let their suspicion of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted them with lead to stagnation of human progress. What do I mean by that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught man by the pen. He's taught man that which man did not know. Muslims did not treat knowledge with suspicion. They used that knowledge and they saw that all as coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it with their tongues. And they thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by using and producing that which was beneficial to mankind. And so when we enter into this maze now of artificial intelligence and all of these different tools and technologies, I wanted us to look at it first and foremost from the macro and then from the micro as individuals. What does this mean for me as a Muslim as things start to arise in my life that seemingly are just tools for convenience? How do I have the spiritual resilience to not fall for something that could actually be harmful and start to contribute in a way, inshallah ta'ala, that is beneficial? And you'll find journal after journal now, professor after professor, people that even worked within these sectors 
that are writing about the danger of these tools and the need to produce ethics around them. That perhaps as human beings, we're moving too fast. We're making things and then because of consumerism, we're releasing them without putting any type of guardrails on them. And then it just becomes a competition, a competition, a competition. And SubhanAllah, first and foremost, we recalibrate and we say that when tech vision has no God vision, then it becomes destructive just like everything else because a godless vision for humanity cannot possibly put guardrails on anything that is produced for humanity. Because at the end of the day, anything that enables convenience is going to be deemed inherently good. Anything that makes life easier is going to be looked at as inherently good. And so we should do whatever we can do, and that's progress. And so it becomes about maximizing profit, maximizing efficiency, maximizing happiness, and eventually what ends up happening is you eliminate the workforce altogether, subhanAllah. And it's all in the name of what? Maximizing, maximizing, maximizing. Make the most of it, make the most of it, make the most of it. And I want to remind you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to spiritual diseases that underlie all sorts of evolving realities. You've been destroyed by the pursuit of more. More, 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 more destroys you as a human being at the individual level and destroys a society as well when it becomes the pursuit of abundance. I want more of this, I want more of that. And more doesn't always just mean more money. It could mean I want more done in as little time as possible. Productivity is good, but when the more becomes the definition, then that's a problem. I want more done for me with as little effort on my part as possible. Of course, we wanna make use of tools for benefit, but what happens when I don't know how to do for myself anything anymore because I've been focused on the production of more and more and more and more. And so eventually in the name of productivity, you end up eliminating the purpose of your own existence altogether. If that's all that you exist for, you're not happy, not as individuals or societies, despite your ability to seemingly do more, gain more, enjoy more, because that's not the void that Allah has put in your human heart that can only be filled with Tawheed, that can only be filled by your belief and your service to God. There is nothing else that's gonna fill that void and you'll destroy yourself with that. And so you take a step back and again, you don't treat the whole thing haram, 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 but you look back at your heart, you look back at your spiritual disease. And SubhanAllah, as you read into these works of people that are familiar with the evolving of these technologies and things that are becoming aware to us. One of the things that, I, that really struck me, SubhanAllah, in, in some of these writings, is that the only thing that is going to be able to sort of curb ourselves, curb our usage of these things and not falling victim to them is a cultural resistance to dependency. I'm gonna say that again, a cultural resistance to dependency. Now, when you think of that from a worldly framework, what people will speak about is this idea of human beings not becoming so dependent on technology that they no longer know how to do basic functions but we become so dependent that we lose basic functions in our brains. And so usually when cultural dependency is spoken about from a worldly perspective, it's we don't want to have people that don't know how to put on their clothes, that don't know how to brush their teeth, that don't know how to do basic things anymore because they've become so dependent on technology. And so there has to be a cultural resistance to this where people still know how to do things. People still know how to change a tire, right? People still know how to do the basic things for themselves because they have become so dependent on these technologies. And so they'll stress the value of knowledge acquisition and skill acquisition, purely from what? From a dunyawi perspective. And SubhanAllah, you look at what Allah has given to us and the Prophet ﷺ has given to us with an akhirah-oriented mindset in this regard. It's not a good thing for a Muslim to be lazy. It's one of the worst things that you could have. Otherwise, you wouldn't seek refuge in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala from it, no matter how convenient things are to you. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an that we will write everything that they have produced as well as their athar. And I'm purposely not translating al-athar because it has two meanings in this ayah. One of them the scholars mention is their legacy. But some of the scholars also say that another meaning of this is not sunnat and hasana, is not a good legacy, but it's literally their footsteps. As Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah said, their footsteps towards good. Everything that they put forth an effort towards, Allah will reward the effort. And so there is, there is a connection between the actual effort itself and the reward, not just the final product. 
but what you do and getting away from that dependency upon things that are outside of your own production. I don't care how intelligent these things become. We will always have the Sanat. We will always have the chain amongst us where we narrate from this person, from that person, from that person, where people memorize the Quran because the Quran is meant to be stored in our hearts and our minds, where knowledge acquisition is through that proper transfer. And so as Muslims, we look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us for the effort itself. And so when people talk about resisting a culture of dependence, so you have to get into Boy Scouts and go out and know how to do things for yourself, and they talk about it purely from a worldly framework, we look at it from the Akhirah incentive as well, from the hereafter incentive as well. That we love to do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we understand that the process itself is rewardable, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us for every moment that we struggle in His path for our salvation and finding joy in everything that we do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So clearly when we talk about this from an ethical perspective, dear brothers and sisters, do not substitute ajr for convenience always. Sometimes you need to do these things so that you can find bi'idhnillahi ta'ala the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm gonna end with two things here inshaAllah ta'ala as well when we're talking about AI. So let me actually put this out there. The world is not going to end by robots. As Muslims, we believe in alamat as sa'a as the Prophet ﷺ gave it to us, the stages of the unfolding of the Day of Judgment. And so the Day of Judgment will come as Allah and the Messenger ﷺ has said. And so all of these signs that happen will still come to pass. But a lot can happen from now until then. And so we have to have that constant ethical framework to where we're approaching these things and saying, how do I make the most of the situation? And how do I insist on still being a human being in this world as it is today? So insisting upon righteousness. And I, I don't believe for a moment that Dajjal is a robot, but I do believe that al Masih al-Dajjal will use all forms of Dajjal and deception that are available to him. And Allah knows what tactics of deception are going to be available to him at the time. I believe in it as Allah and the Messenger وسلم, spoke about it. That's how we are as Muslims. So I understand the doom and gloom as well. But Allah has given us something to ground ourselves bidnillahi ta'ala. And the last thing I'll say here is your Lord is precise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from hurting ourselves or from hurting others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to make the most of what is around us. And may Allah azza wa jal reward us for our efforts and make our outputs beneficial to us in this dunya and the next. Allahumma ameen. Your support can help us continue to educate and motivate people to make and publish videos daily. Jazakallah.